very much, Brother Michael, and thank you. Um, it's great to see so many faces from um, people that I remember. Now, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, can I just get someone to come on and tell me if you can see that, that picture I'm sharing? Yeah, well, that's excellent. Okay, very good. All right, so um, thank you very much for the invite to be able to speak with all of you this afternoon. We just read from the opening verses of Ezekiel 38, which as you, you probably are aware, it's a prophecy about the events that happened just before Christ returns to the earth. And the main thing that happens in that chapter is a war. There's an army that invades Israel. And, and that's part of the events that happen just before Christ returns. And we're told that army comes from the north. So they're a big force from the very far north of Israel that comes down and invades Israel. Now, what we want to talk about tonight is the fact that in that chapter, many times it says Israel will be dwelling in safety and uh, in, in peace and safety. And they'll be dwelling in, in villages that don't have walls or gates. Now, that's quite a challenging um, concept because we all expect Jesus to return any moment now. And yet, if we look at the land of Israel, they don't dwell in peace and safety. And if we look at photos or videos, or if you've ever visited the land of Israel, you might know that there's lots of walls and there's big bars and there's big gates. So the question we want to try and understand tonight is what does dwelling in safety and dwelling in peace and safety actually mean and there's a bit of a clue from my title because in the reading we read it says they're all dwelling safe safely but you can see from my title I have added something to that so that gives you a bit of a clue as to how we're going to dis, um, work through this tonight now if at any time I'm talking about something on the screen and it doesn't show up Please just unmute yourself and let me know um, in case my screen stops working, um, stops sharing. But hopefully you can see coming up now an outline or at least a, a picture of a very angry man with a rope. Um, here's an outline of what we're going to talk about. There's five things that we want to talk about tonight. Firstly, we want to understand where does the idea of Israel dwelling in safety, where in the Bible is that from? It's in Ezekiel 38, but it must be from other places too. So we're going to have a look at um, some passages in Scripture to understand that. Second, we're going to go back to our reading and pull out just a few important facts to help us understand. Then we're going to look at some current events. We're going to look at Israel's history of peace treaties and conflict. So two sides of the coin where Israel has been at peace in history and where Israel has been at war. Then we're going to try and understand what does it actually mean when Ezekiel says they'll be dwelling safely. And if you're wondering why there's some letters and numbers there, H983, that's because that's a word, that's the Hebrew word. We're going to look at the actual meaning of the word. And finally, we're going to look at some things we can watch out for in the coming months. And thank you, everyone, for your expectations. It's good to, to hear those questions you have. So hopefully I can answer those tonight. Um, I noticed a few of those expectations were asking, what's the point for us? What can we learn in our daily lives from Israel? So hopefully we can touch on that at the end as well. So let's start off by understanding point number one, what where does the idea of dwelling safely in the land come from? Now, please, please look up these quotes and, and I'll, I'll read them. I'm, I'm going to read from the King James Version, um, unless, unless I say otherwise. I, I have the odd quote in the ESV, but please look up these quotes in your own Bible. What we're going to do here is look up five quotes where dwelling safely appears in the Old Testament. So the first one is in Leviticus 25, and this is what it says. God says to the people, Wherefore, you shall do my statutes and keep my judgments, and you shall dwell in the land in safety. And the land shall yield her fruit, and you will eat your fill and dwell in safety. So God says to the people, if you obey me, if you keep my judgments, if you keep my law, then you'll live safely. 
and you'll have plenty to eat. Okay, that's great. So that's that's the first one. Now come over a couple of pages to Deuteronomy 12. We get the same idea here. In Deuteronomy 12, verse 10 to 11, God says, uh, actually Moses is speaking here, and he says, but when you go over Jordan and dwell in the land which the Lord your God gives you to inherit, when he gives you rest from all your enemies round about so that you dwell safely, then there shall be a place where the Lord God will choose his name to dwell there. So Moses says, when you go over into the land, you'll be able to dwell safely and you'll be able to have a place where God's name will dwell, like build a tabernacle. The next one is Deuteronomy 33. This says, verse 11 and 12, bless Lord his substance, accept the work of his hands, smite through the loins of those that rise against them and those that hate them and they rise not. And of Benjamin, he said, the beloved of the Lord shall dwell in safety by him and the Lord shall cover him all the day long and he shall dwell between his shoulders. So that is a prophecy speaking of all the different tribes and of Benjamin, it says he'll dwell safely and he'll be able to um, dwell between his shoulders, between God's shoulders. So it's saying that when they're in the land, they will be able to be at peace. Now, we see this idea not just in the law of Moses, um, by the way, if I keep looking over that direction, it's because I have another screen with all my quotes on it. So that's why I'm looking off to the side. Um, uh, we, we see this idea in Psalm 4 verse 8. This verse says, this is the psalmist writing a song, and he says, I will lay me down in peace and sleep. For you, Lord, only make me dwell in safety. And then finally, one more quote, this one from Proverbs 1 verse 33. But whoso hearkens unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. So that's five quotes in the Old Testament which talk about dwelling safely. So it was a promise God made to the people of Israel. Now, there's lots of other references as well. Let's just think of three other ones. Now, you probably have heard of the phrase, every man dwelling under his vine and under his fig tree. Now, this appears three times in the Old Testament. Now, you don't have to turn these up. I'll just read them to you. First Kings 4, verse 24 and 25. This is talking about Solomon. And it says, he had dominion over all the region from this side of the river, from Tifsar even to Azar, over all the kings on this side of the river. And he had peace on all sides round about him. And Judah and Israel dwelt safely. Every man under his vine and under his fig tree, from Dan to Beersheba, all the days of King Solomon. So you'll see that verse had that phrase, every man dwelt safely under his vine and under his fig tree. So imagine a beautiful afternoon in Israel. There's no enemies about and you're relaxing under your vine and you're eating some figs off your tree. That's the image the Bible gives you. Now, there's another one. In um, Micah 4, verse 3 and 4. Now, this is actually a prophecy about Jesus Christ. And it says, He shall judge among many people. He will rebuke strong nations afar off. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, neither will they learn war anymore. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid. And then finally, in Zechariah 3, verse 10, there's the same idea again. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, you will call every man his neighbor under the vine and under the fig tree. So the idea of reading in Ezekiel 38 of, of Israel dwelling safely in their land that was a key promise of the Old Testament. That's what all the Israelites look forward to, a chance when they could be in their land and they could eat their vine and their fig tree and not be scared of their enemies. So now that we've established that idea, turn back to Ezekiel 38 and let's get just a few key facts out of this passage to, to remind ourselves of, of some key ideas that come out. So Ezekiel 38, the reason I have a picture of tanks there, they are Russian tanks, is because this is a chapter about an invasion. 
It's an invasion far from the north of Israel, and they come down and they attack Israel. Now, let's figure out when this chapter takes place. So if we look over, um, we're going to particularly look at verse 8 to 11. So I might read it again. Verse 8 to 11 of Ezekiel 38. After, oh, by the way, I need to point something out. Um, the person being spoken to in this prophecy is not Israel. The person being spoken to in this prophecy is someone called Gog, and that is the army commander from the north. So you, you need to remember when you read this chapter, God is not talking to Israel. He is talking to Gog. He is talking to the army that's going to invade. And this is what he says. After many days, verse 8, you will be visited. In the latter years, you shall come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people. And in case you don't know who that is, it says against the mountains of Israel, which have always been laid waste. Um, but which is brought forth out of the nations, and they shall dwell safely, all of them. You, Gog, will come like a storm, and you will be like a cloud covering the land. You and all your bands and many people with you. Verse 10, thus says the Lord God, it shall come to pass at the same time, evil thoughts will come into your mind, and you shall think an evil thought and say, I will go to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls, having neither bars or gates. In verse 12, why is Gog going there? He wants to take a spoil. He wants their stuff. He wants their riches. So let's just get those key ideas. So this invasion happens after many days in the latter years. So Ezekiel is giving this prophecy and he prophesied between B.C. 593 to B.C. 571. So almost 600 years before Christ came is when Ezekiel was giving this prophecy. But this is not going to happen for a long time in the future, Ezekiel says. And it's the invasion is going to happen when Israel has been brought back from the sword, when they are back in the mountains of Israel. Now, that helps us understand exactly when it, it has to be after AD 70, because in AD 70, 70 years after Jesus, Jerusalem was destroyed and the Jews were scattered all over the world. And Ezekiel says this prophecy happens when they've all been brought home again. Now, the wonderful thing for you and I is that Israel only started to come back home in the 1950s, and it's been happening. They've been returning ever since then. So this prophecy must happen sometime after Israel has been gathered back into the land. So that's how we know this prophecy is, is not yet fulfilled. And it describes Israel as a land of unwalled villages, people that are resting and dwelling safely without walls or gates or bars. So to summarize, I know we've gone through that quite quickly, but to summarize, the invasion of Israel from the northern invader, which most Christadelphians believe is Russia because of where it is located. That occurs many days in the latter years following Ezekiel's prophecy. It must happen after Israel had been brought back into their land when they are dwelling in the mountains of Israel and at a time in history when Israel is said to be dwelling safely in a land of unwalled villages. So that seems like a pretty straightforward set of circumstances. But here's a question for you. Does this chapter mean before Christ can return, Israel must be dwelling in safety? Now, this is quite a challenging idea, and I'll put two things on the screen to show you why. Number one, we often think because of Ezekiel 38 that the nation of Israel must be in a state of peace before Christ returns. Yet at the same time, we also say the return of Christ is very soon. Now, those ideas don't necessarily fit together too well. If one hand we say they must be dwelling in safety, and then on the other hand we say Jesus is coming very soon, it's quite difficult because what we're going to see is that Israel have not been dwelling in safety at any time in the past 70 years. Now, I want to be clear. I'm not suggesting Jesus is not going to return very soon. He, he, I don't know when he, he's going to return. 
And in fact, um, he could return tonight and we'll all get taken away to judgment. And while we're at judgment, maybe peace happens in Israel. But I think there's another answer. I think there's another way of explaining this. Um, and, and that way is that dwelling safely doesn't actually mean exactly what we think it means. And the really exciting part is that Jesus Christ can return any day. We do not have to wait for peace in Israel. And I'm going to hopefully show you why now. So before we look at that, let's have a quick recap of Israel's peace treaties um, and, and their history of war and conflict. Now, Israel has only signed a small number of peace treaties with other nations. And if you're interested in Israel, you'll know that they are surrounded by Arab nations who hate them and who want to drive them into the sea. So let's see who's made peace with Israel. Now, that's a famous picture on the screen um, of um, Bill Clinton overseeing a, a, a peace treaty. Um, actually, that wasn't actually a peace treaty. That was a peace agreement. And there's a slight difference, but we won't go into that now. But here's the formal peace treaties that have been signed. Egypt signed a peace treaty in March 1979. Jordan signed a peace treaty with Israel in October 94. And then last year, we had the Abraham Accords. And if you don't know about these, I suggest you Google them in your own time and read about them. And so what that meant was that in August last year, this time one year ago, the United Arab Emirates signed an agreement, a peace treaty with Israel, followed by Bahrain, Sudan and Morocco. Now, if we look at that list, what you will realize is that only two countries in the past 41 years had signed peace agreements with Israel. And then in the space of five months, that number tripled from two countries to six. Now, that seems pretty exciting. And we might say, wow, Israel's at peace. But the truth is they're not, because there's still a lot of countries that hate Israel that are around them, like Syria and Lebanon and Gaza and um, the obvious one, Iran and Iraq. There's lots of countries around Israel that, that still hate Israel. So let's now think, so there's only three peace treaties and six countries who have made, six Arab nations who have made peace treaties with Israel. Let's now look, look at a list of their major conflicts. Now, there's so many, I've just put up a table to try and summarize it. So on the left-hand side of that table, you can see the peace treaties, Egypt, Jordan, and then the Abraham Accords. And then on the right-hand side, you can see all the different wars they've been involved in. Now, hopefully you can see my mouse. Some of these wars, like this, the in 1948, when Israel was made a nation, they had a, the Arab-Israeli war. In the 50s and 60s, there was a, an insurgency, like constant attacks. Um, there was a big war in 1967, the Six-Day War, which Israel actually won. And that was where all their neighbours ganged up on them. There was another war following on that, which went for another three years. Um, I won't talk through the whole list, but you can see that Israel has been at war a lot from 1948 right up to 2014. Now, here's an important point. Israel has effectively been at war for most of the period of when they returned to the land in 1948 up to the end of the 2014 Gaza war. So for 66 years, that's almost double the amount of time I've been alive. For 66 years, they have been at war. Now, it's very difficult to look at that chart on the screen and say Israel has been dwelling safely. However, there is a big gap there because from 2015 to 2020, there was no formal war. Israel was not at war. And so we might think, great, Israel's been at peace. But actually, we'll find out that's not the case. And by the way, all of that changed on the 23rd of April this year when 36 rockets were fired at southern Israel. And that began the 2021 Israel-Palestinian Gaza Strip crisis. So, of course, uh, another war has now started off. But there's still that gap in the chart where there's been no formal war. Now, does that mean Israel 
were dwelling in peace and safety. Was every man under his vine and fig tree, relaxing and feeling safe? Well, one way we can test that theory is to look at the number of rocket attacks there have been in Israel. Now, there's a lot of information online about this, and I've just tried to summarize it. Again, if you want to look it up yourself, you can easily Google it. It's very interesting. But what I have on the screen is a chart of all the rockets that have been fired um, from Gaza toward Israel. Now, that's just from Gaza to Israel. It does not include rockets fired from Syria or other places. Now, this information is from the Israeli Defense Force. And what you can see is that they generally have over a thousand rockets fired at them a year. Now, clearly there was a drop off in 2015, 16 and 17. And I don't actually know the reason why. But in 2018 and 19, it all started again. In the year 2020, there weren't that many rockets. There was only about 200 rockets fired. It was possibly because of the coronavirus. But in 2021, by the way, this, this chart is from May. So that, that red bar will be even higher now. So in 2021, it's all started off again. So there's been lots of rocket attacks um, toward Israel. Now, it's such a problem for the Israelis that they have had to change how they live their lives. And so what they have done is create something called the Iron Dome. Now, if you have time, I don't do it in my talk, but I highly suggest you go on YouTube and you look up a video about the Iron Dome. But what it is, it's a missile defense system. And so when rockets are fired from Gaza or from Syria into Israel, Israel have these, these systems which detect, they use um, satellites to figure out where the rocket is, and then they send their own rocket up to intercept it and blow it up before it can land. Now, what's amazing about it is they don't just figure out where the rocket is, they figure out where it's going to land. So if they, a, a rocket is fired and the Israelis work out that it's going to land in farmland, they don't blow it up. They just leave it. And maybe a cow or a, or a goat dies. It's all very sad. But if they figure out the missile is going to land in a populated area, like where, where there's a town, that's when they fire their rocket up to, to blow it up. And the reason that they let some rockets fall and they don't is because of money, because it's extremely expensive. So just to give you an idea, that bat, see the number four on the screen. Number two, three, and four is, is the Israeli system called Iron Dome. So number two is the radar system. Number three is the, the control piece that works out where the rocket is going to land because it, it tracks its, its trajectory. And number four is the missile launcher to, to fire off and, and intercept it. Now, those three units combined cost 50 million US dollars. For one, for those three units, are, they're one battery. They cost 50 million US dollars. Now, one missile inside that unit costs 40,000 US dollars. So they are extremely expensive to operate. Now, the reason that's important is that in June 2021, where there was a report that said Israel's defense chief, his name is Benny Gantz, he traveled to Washington, D.C., to ask the US to give them another $1 billion to help fund this defense system because it's so expensive for Israel to run, they cannot pay for it on their own. Now, I think I have a picture of it. So my opening slide that's showing up there, that's the battery there. That's the missile launcher showing. Um, so one of those, a single missile firing out is um, 40,000 US dollars. Um, and I believe they hold about, either 12 or 24 rockets, I'm not entirely sure. So they are very, very expensive. Now in May, the Israel Defense Force posted this note on Twitter. It says, Hamas and Islamic Jihad have fired over 3000 rockets from Gaza in the past seven days. That's the highest daily rate of rocket fire the country has ever faced. The threat is real, Millions of Israelis are living under fire. We will continue to defend ourselves. Okay, so that's rockets. So just because Israel has not been in a formal war does not mean that they are living safely. They, they have, they're only in some form of security because of the missile defense system. 
And even that requires the US to help pay for it. What about terrorism? Well, here's some stats on terrorism. Now, terrorism in Israel is usually linked to Palestinian political violence. But here's the number of deaths from terrorist acts in Israel. Um, and this is from the Jewish Virtual Library, and it's using data from the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Now, 162 people dying in 11 years doesn't look that bad, I suppose, but it's still 15 people a year dying from terrorism. Now, if you consider, I don't know what the Philippines is like in terms of terrorism, but in Australia, we've only had really one main terrorism attack, which happened in 2014, and three people died. And it was a huge event. It was all over the news. Now, in Israel, 15 people die every single year on average from terrorism. So that's, that's still a, a country with a lot of security problems. And then finally, there's just the general day-to-day -day violence between Israelis and Palestinians. Now, there's some great Wikipedia pages on this. You can look up 2015 Israeli-Palestinian violence. 2016, is, you can look it up by year on Wikipedia, and it lists out all the different events that have happened. And some of them are small things, like someone stabs someone on a bus or someone drives a car into a shop because, you know, it's the shop's owned by a Palestinian and, and the, the driver was a, a right-wing Jew or something like that. But there's hundreds of events that happen every year that are not rocket attacks and are not terrorist attacks, but are just general violence. Hundreds of events a year. So let's pause. I need a drink of water. I've been getting so excited. Let's pause and, and think about what we've just summarized. Israel has been at war for 66 years out of the past 70, 73 odd years of their history. So for, for nearly every year since they've been a nation, they've been involved in some kind of formal war. We looked at rocket attacks from 2005 to 2021, and we saw it the huge amount. They have thousands of rocket attacks a year, and in the first five months of this year, they had 3,000 rockets fired at Israel. We looked at terrorist attacks from 2010 to 2021, and we've briefly mentioned the general violence from 2015 to 2021. So with all of that in mind, no reasonable person could say that Israel has truly been dwelling safely at any point in their history. Now, that comes back to our tough question for tonight. If we think Ezekiel 38 is, means that Israel must be dwelling safely before Christ returns, then clearly we're going to have to wait a bit longer because Israel are not dwelling in, safely, in safety. Or it's possible that the words in Ezekiel 38 actually mean something slightly different. So that's what I want us to look at now. So turn up um, Ezekiel 38, if you, well, you're probably still there. And we want to look up what it actually means when it says all these people are going to be dwelling safely. Now, the key word that we're going to look at tonight is the word, it's in English. It's, the English word is safely. And the Hebrew word is on, on the screen, betar. Now, let's have a look at what Jesenius says. Now, Jesenius, if you're not familiar, is a scholar of Hebrew. And this is what it says about the word betar. It, it can mean, number one, confidence or confidently, dwelling confidently. Number two, it can mean security. And part of that meaning is safely. So if you have a big fence around your property, then you probably feel safe because it's going to be very difficult for someone to get in. If, like me, you have two very big, scary, and quite ferocious dogs, you feel even more safe. Or well, my dogs look scary, but once you come in the gate, they just lick you and, and love you and want you to throw the ball. But they can look a bit scary from behind the gate. So those dogs help me feel secure. So that's also what this word can mean. And then the third meaning is it's, it's the name of a town as well. But we can ignore that because that's not relevant tonight. So, oops, I've gone too far. Right, so that's what Jesenius says about this word. So when we hear the word safely, we think it means without any enemies coming to get us at peace. But what we're going to discover is it actually means more than that. Now, the next thing we want to do is look up um, some 
places where this word appears. Now, we already know five places because we looked them up earlier. Those five quotes on the screen are places where the Bible said Israel would dwell safely. And from the context, it clearly meant at rest. So if you're sitting under your vine and if you're picking grapes off your vine and picking figs off your bush, you are at rest. You are feeling peace and safe, peaceful and safe, um, safe, very safe. But there are some other places in scripture where the same word is used, but the context is very different. Now, I'd like us to look these quotes up, but I have put them in a table just to make it a bit easier. So turn over to Genesis 34. What we're going to do here is look up 10 quotes, which show us how the word betar can mean something other than just safely. So Genesis 34. Now, this story is, and we, we are going to go through these quite quickly. Um, so sorry if, if it's all a bit too fast, but just take a photo of the screen and, and you can look through it in your own time. But in this story, um, the two of the sons of Jacob are going to go and attack the city of Shechem. Now, they trick the men of Shechem to, um, into being circumcised, which means the men were very, very sore and they didn't really want to get out of bed for the next three days. And when that had happened, in verse 25, it says, it came to pass on the third day when the men of the city were sore because they'd just been circumcised, two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, took each man his sword and in the King James, it says they came upon the city boldly and they slew all the men. Now that word boldly in Hebrew is the word betar. So it's the same word that appears in other places as safely, but here it means boldly. Now, of course, they came upon the city boldly because they would tricked all the men into being circumcised. So none of those men wanted to get out of bed and swing a sword and defend themselves. So Simeon and Levi, two men, were able to boldly attack the city and kill everybody. So in that context, betar means confidently or boldly. Now come across to Judges chapter 8, because we see this idea again. In Judges chapter 8, Gideon is about to attack an army. And it says in verse 11, And Gideon went up by the way of them that dwelt in tents on the east of Nobah and Jovahar, and he smote the host, for the host was secure. Now, it's a bit tricky in the King James, but if you look up the NIV, it says he attacked the unsuspecting army. And if you look up the ESV translation, it says Gideon attacked the army for the army felt secure. Now, from the context, that means that Gideon was able to surprise this army and attack them because they were not expecting it. So they were obviously camped and they were not ready for battle and Gideon surprised them and attacked the army. And that word secure or unsuspecting is the Hebrew word batar. So in this context, batar does not mean safe. It means careless or unsuspecting or unaware. Right, well, turn over a couple more pages in Judges 18 because we see exactly the same idea. In Judges 18, um, verse 7, um, this is a story where some men are spying out the land. And it says they spied out the land in verse 7. Um, the five men departed and came to Laish, and they saw the people that were therein, how they dwelt carelessly. Um, or quiet, uh, and it says that they dwelt after the manner of the Zidonians, quiet and secure. Um, I think someone's unmuted themselves, sorry, so just make sure you're on mute if you can. Um, that that word quiet and secure is the word batar, and in the um, in the ESV it says they lived in security, quiet and unsuspecting. And in the NIV, it says the same thing. So these five men spied out the land. They got out their binoculars and they spied out the land and they saw a group of people who were not expecting to be attacked. So it doesn't mean they were safe. It means they were unsuspecting or unaware. Okay, so that's the first three quotes. So let's come to the next three. So Proverbs 3 verse 9 is a proverb, a piece of wisdom that says, um, let me read it from the King James. Um, sorry, Proverbs 3, verse 29, 
devise not evil against your neighbor, seeing he dwells securely by you. Um, in the, the um, ESV and the NIV, it says, don't devise evil against your neighbor who dwells trustingly by you. So your neighbor knows you. They trust you. They never expect you to attack them. So you shouldn't. And again, it uses the word betar. So here in this context, it means unsuspecting or unaware. Now, you should be seeing a pattern. You should already see where I'm going. Now, in Isaiah 47, um, it would, maybe for the sake of time, we can stop looking these up. You can just see them on the screen. In Isaiah 47, verse 5 and 8, it's a prophecy about Babylon or the Chaldeans. And it says she dwells carelessly. But in verse 9, it's very clear that she's about to be attacked. So again, in the context, Batar means careless. It can even mean arrogant because the daughter of the Chaldeans sits on her throne and says, no one's going to attack me. I'm far too strong. So she's arrogant. She does, is not aware of what is coming upon her. Now, in Jeremiah 49, verse 31, Nebuchadnezzar is told by God to attack Hazor. And in that chapter, it says, go up to the wealthy nation that dwells without care, that's the word batar, which have neither gates nor bars. The NIV says, arise and attack a nation at ease who dwells in confidence. Now, the reason that verse is so interesting is that Hazor did have gates and bars. But when God talks to Nebuchadnezzar about it, he talks as though there are no gates or bars. And the reason for that is because the people dwell confidently. They are not expecting an attack. They are unaware and, and um, very confident in their own ability. So that's the next three quotes. So let's look at the last four quotes on the screen. Um, in Ezekiel chapter 30, judgment is pronounced upon Egypt and her allies. And it says, messengers will go forth from me to make the careless Ethiopians afraid. Now that word careless is the Hebrew word batar. Um, the NIV says, go forward to frighten Kush or Ethiopia out of her complacency. So in this context, betar means careless, complacent, unsuspecting. Now, we see the same idea repeated in the final three quotes, which I won't go through, but you can see there on the screen. What's interesting is that one of those quotes is in the very chapter after Ezekiel 38. It's in Ezekiel 39. So each time, 10 times, we come across this word batar, clearly from the context, it does not mean safe. It means careless or arrogant or confident or secure or unsuspecting. It's nothing to do with being safe. It's all about an attitude, a mindset. And in many of those quotes, the people who were careless, unsuspecting, they got attacked and they got destroyed because they were not expecting it. And that is the really important thing. And what's really interesting about Ezekiel is that in chapter 30, the word is, is translated as careless or unsuspecting. And in chapter 39, it's translated as careless or unsuspecting. But in chapter 38, the, the translators decided to use the word safely. Perhaps that wasn't the best thing to do because we can see whenever that word is used, or not always, but often when that word is used from the context, the context is normally a battle and it's normally used of a people who are not safe, but they are careless. So that's what I think dwelling safely in Ezekiel 38 is all about from the context. And it's not hard to understand how that could be true of Israel. You think of how powerful Israel are. They have the Israeli Defense Force. They have the Mossad, the Secret Service. They have the Iron Dome missile system. They have the backing of the, the strongest army in the Middle East, the Israeli army. And they have the backing of the United States Army, the most powerful army in the world. So it's not hard to understand how Israel feel confident. They are very sure of themselves. And that perhaps is the reason why it says in Ezekiel 38, they're dwelling not just safely, but confidently, that Hebrew word batar.
But that leaves us with one challenging question. What about the unwalled villages? Because Ezekiel 38 clearly said they'll be living in unwalled villages. And if you look at the picture of Jerusalem on, on the screen, if there's one thing you'll notice, it's not unwalled at all. There's lots of walls in there. And, and, and Jerusalem is divided by walls and lots of, um, of other cities in, in Israel. Sorry, I might just try and mute someone because someone's off mute again. Um, I think it's the Kali Langan Ecclesia, possibly. I can't actually see. So just check your unmute if you can. Um, so what, what does it mean when, when Ezekiel 38 talks about unwalled villages? Well, there's two things to understand, and I think it's quite easy. Firstly, Ezekiel 38 is full of symbolic language. It's not written in literal language. It's symbolic. Now, if you look down the chapter, I'll give you a few examples. In Ezekiel 38 verse 4, God says to Gog, the northern invader, I will put hooks in your jaws and pull you down. Now, God's not literally going to put hooks in the, in the army's mouths and pull them down. It is symbolic language. It's, it's not literal. Um, in verse 4, it describes the army as horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with armor, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them holding swords. Now, again, that's symbolic language. We're not expecting a northern invader to come into Israel with horses. Most likely, they'll use missiles and tanks and, and foot soldiers. So that's symbolic language. In verse 9, it says, you will come like a storm. Now, we're not expecting them to literally come like a storm and clouds in the air. That's just a, a, a symbolic way of explaining it. Um, and again, it says in verse 15, um, all of them riding horses, a great company. In verse 20, it says, the fish of the sea, the fowls of the air, the beasts of the earth, they'll all shake at my presence. So it's all symbolic language. So we need to remember that when we're reading the whole chapter. Because when we get to the part of unwalled villages, if we're reading the rest of the chapter symbolically, we can't then read unwalled villages as though it's literal, because that is not consistent. So unwalled villages is, is a symbolic meaning. It is a symbol of something. And I believe the symbol is the attitude of the people. And there is a good example of that in the Bible. One of the quotes we had on the screen, when God says to Nebuchadnezzar, go and attack Hazor, that, that confident people that dwell securely without bars or gates. And Hazor was a town with bars and gates. So we know that it's a symbolic way of talking about people who are secure. And the second point to notice is that, remember, in Ezekiel um, 38, God is talking to Gog. And in that verse where we see, verse 11, where it mentions unwalled villages, who is talking? It is Gog. It is the evil thought in Gog's mind. He is talking and he says, I will go and attack the land of unwalled villages. In other words, this is the perspective of the attacker. They look at Israel and they see Israel as an easy target, as though there were no walls or gates or bars. Now, that's my, my view of, of how to explain that, my, my personal opinion. I don't think we need to see every single wall, every single gate, and every single bar taken out of Israel before Christ can return. That would make no sense because there are walls and houses. So clearly the, the language in this chapter is symbolic. And when we read that Israel is dwelling safely, remember the word betar, the Hebrew word. And remember that 10 times in the Bible, from the context, it is not about dwelling safely. It is about dwelling confidently, arrogantly. It is about people who are unsuspecting, who are so sure in their own strength, they don't think anyone can attack them. That's the important thing, I think. So let's conclude and, and um, conclude with four points about what we've talked about tonight. Number one, I better put them on screen. Oh no, that's the next part, that's the last bit. All right, number one, ever since the beginning of scripture, from Genesis through the rest of the law of Moses, it has been the hope of Israel to dwell safely in their land. And we saw lots of quotes from the law, 
from Psalms, from Proverbs and from the prophets about people dwelling safely. Number two, modern history reveals that this hope of dwelling in safely, safety, free from enemies, has not been true for Israel at any time from 1948 to the present day, because they've nearly always been at war, they've been under constant rocket attacks, and uh, there's been lots of terrorism and violence. Number three, a close examination of scripture reveals a strong argument from the context of an alternate reading of the word safely or batar, boldness, confidence, security, to the point of even being arrogant. It's a bit like a, a basketball team that are so confident in their own ability, they don't think anyone else can beat them. Um, someone needs to un unmute just for a second if you can. Unmute, uh, please, sorry. It's a bit like a sports team. Like they're so sure of themselves that no one's going to beat us. That, that's the idea that we get from that context. And to me, that's a pretty apt description of Israel who put their trust in their own army, the, 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 um, the, their air force, their secret service, their Iron Dome missile system, the backing of the US, all these things they put their confidence in but not their almighty God. And finally, the final point, the unwalled villagers comment in Ezekiel is made from the view of the attacker. It is the attacker's view of Israel as though Israel is going to be an easy target. It's like they've got no gates or bars. Now, finally, I think that is a very encouraging understanding of Ezekiel 38 because what it means is that we're not waiting for anything to happen. Israel could be attacked by a northern invader at any time in the immediate or in the immediate time frame or in the future. We, I don't believe we need to wait for for magical peace to happen to Israel because it's never been peaceful in the past seventy years, and we, we do need Israel to be dwelling in their land, and that's a big tick, and we do need them to be. Um, to be brought back from, from um, captivity, which, is, which has also happened. But I believe contextually, it's more about their attitude, dwelling confidently and, and with security. So that's a very encouraging thing to realize that the return of Christ, certainly as far as Ezekiel 38 reads, could be any time. Now, what does that mean for us? Well, in the expectations, people asked about you know, that what does Israel mean to us today? Well, clearly Israel is still the apple of God's eye. There is a natural Israel and there is spiritual Israel, all of those of us who have been baptized into Jesus Christ. But God has not cast off Israel and, and they remain very important to him and they will be the, a key part of the coming kingdom of God. He is deeply concerned with Israel and we should be too. And I think it's important for us to, to take a look at current events and keep an eye on Israel and what's happening and to be encouraged by the knowledge that all of the prophecies that have been fulfilled in the past are a reminder that those that are unfulfilled are still waiting to happen. So we need to keep on our toes. We need to keep a watchful eye. Now, here's just four ideas to close about things we could watch for. Now, when I first did this talk, I did this talk at Punch Bowl in about May, and the man on the screen was hoping to become the Prime Minister of Israel. Um, his name is Naphtali Bennett, and he was going to replace another man called Benjamin Netanyahu, who, who's been in power for 12 or 14 years, maybe even longer. And the reason that's interesting is that he is, the man on the screen, Naphtali Bennett, is a real right winger. Now, if you don't really follow politics, that means he's got pretty extreme views He's very strong about Israel, um, about setting up um, settler communities. He's, he's all about the Jews, and he's not really that interested in compromise. So it was in, interesting in May to see if he was going to come into power. And guess what? He's now the prime minister of Israel. And it will be interesting to see how that turns world um, um, other leaders against Israel because he's not very interested in compromising. He's all about um, pushing the agenda of, of the Jews. So he's a, a right-wing politician, has come to power. 
It will be interesting to watch what the world's response is to the ongoing settler issues in the West Bank. And if you're not familiar with that, um, the settler issues is where Israel um, bulldozes old villages that used to be um, occupied by Palestinians and they build new villages and put Jews in them. Um, and that creates a lot of consternation or a lot of worry on the world um, stage. It will be interesting to see how the um, Gaza conflict plays out. And to be honest, I've been so busy at work, I haven't actually kept up with it myself since about June. So I need to have a good look and see what's happened in the Gaza conflict. But one thing you can be sure of is that even if that conflict has ended, there'll probably be another one sometime soon because that's always been Israel's history. And it would be interesting to see what the US said with respect to Israel's request for another billion dollars to keep funding the Iron Dome, because that is one of the things that really makes Israel dwell in, secure, in security and confidence, that gives them you know, a real solid feeling of strength. So let us be watchful and excited about God's hand as he continues to work toward the deliverance of his people Israel. Even though for the most part, the people of Israel remain arrogantly confident in their own mind, God will remember the promises to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to David, to all the faithful people of old, because he's a God that, that remembers and does not lie. So he will remember those promises. And even though the Jews today dwell securely he and confidently, he will, he will remember his promises. And you can be sure just as Ezekiel 38 says, the day is coming when Israel will realize they must put their faith, their trust in their rock, in their God. It is their God upon whom they must depend. So let's keep a keen eye on, on world events regarding Israel and, and look forward to hopefully the soon return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks very much. I'll hand back over to... Um, Brother Michael, and happy to take um, any questions if anyone has any.